Welcome, Christian friends, to this study of selected texts in the New Testament from a Middle Eastern cultural perspective. We know that our Lord was born in Palestine according to the providence of God, and that he thereby grew up, shared the culture of the Palestinian world, shared with them a common language, a common culture, spoke as a Palestinian to his fellow Palestinians, sharing not only the culture of that part of the world, but the rich heritage of the Judaism of his past. For a number of centuries now, we as Christian scholars have realized that to understand more precisely what these texts are all about, we are obliged to look as carefully as we can to the Aramaic, Middle Eastern, Jewish background of the texts. And this is true not only of the person of our Lord, but also true of the writings of the other key theologians of the New Testament, such as the Apostle Paul. We know that Paul was born in Tarsus, but when he says, I was brought up in Jerusalem, the verb there we now know means brought up from a child. And so his basic cultural orientation is also very, very Middle Eastern. And his language, of course, he is writing in Greek, but he's thinking in Hebrew. And so his language and assumptions and attitudes are also deeply colored by the past of which he is a part, both culturally and religiously. And so we're going to hit three high points of New Testament studies that we trust will be of interest to you in this series. First of all, we wish to look at the Lord's Prayer, which itself, of course, was originally spoken in Aramaic and has tremendous riches in it when we look at the Aramaic words that we can assume stand behind the Greek words in the text. And then second, we will look at the great 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, this great hymn of love which Paul may well have written long before he wrote to the Corinthians and may have incorporated into the book of Corinthians as a part of the tradition which he spoke in every church and which he uses with great skill and sensitivity speaking to the problems of the Corinthian church. Then third, we're going to look at the question widely debated around the world and Christian circles in our day of women in the New Testament. And we will find that there are three kinds of material. One is the women themselves and the texts in which they occur. And one is the place which the New Testament community in Christ gave to women. And the third is the use of female imagery in theology, theological images that are themselves basically female images. I'm sure you know of this debate and no doubt have opinions regarding it and no doubt have read things also. And so we will try to bring a Middle Eastern cultural perspective to this wide debate and see if we can find, as I am convinced we can, a unity and harmony to the witness of the New Testament on this critical question for our day and for every day. And so first of all, let us see our Lord as he taught the disciples to pray. And what was it that he told them to pray about? And what are the styles of prayer that he asked them to use? Now we have the Lord's Prayer in Matthew in its longer form and in Luke in its shorter form. We will be looking at the longer form in Matthew, but in Luke we recall that there we're told about the disciples' question. They come and say, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. Now these are Jews. It's not as though they don't know how to pray. How on earth can we understand this very peculiar or seemingly very peculiar question? These are not people who have these are not Greeks who don't know how to pray. These are not pagans. They're not Syrians. These are Jews. They've been praying for centuries. How on earth can these pious Jews come and say, well, now please teach us how to pray? Well, two things that we'll see are important to understand their question. Now, one thing is that we'll see that Jesus teaches them a quite radically new style of prayer. And the other thing is, that he teaches them to pray in their own language. But these things we will return to in a minute. 
we find that the Lord's Prayer is introduced in Matthew with the phrase, don't, when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do because they think they're going to be heard for their many words. Amazingly, the prayers of Jesus that we have recorded are quite short. Now, we know that he spent all night in prayer on occasion, but the ones we have recorded are brief and to the point. It's very easy for us to assume that a long prayer equals a good prayer and a short prayer equals a bad prayer. This doesn't seem to be the case in the words of our Lord, as he would say here. The Gentiles, whenever they addressed their gods, or whenever they addressed Caesar, who of course was one of the gods, the point was you had to be sure to get all of his titles correct, or he might get upset. Now, this went on to ex an extent that is utterly ridiculous. Just for fun, let me read to you a decree that uh, G Galerius Caesar put out in the year 300, easing the persecution of Christians just before Constantine made Christianity a legal religion. Now, this is the emperor himself going to put out a decree. So we expect him to say, I, Caesar, decree such and such. But this isn't what he says. Here is what he writes in this decree, which is recorded by Eusebius, the famous church historian, because the decree was of particular interest to Christians. The emperor Caesar Galerius Valerius Maximanus Invictus Augustus Pontifex Maximus Germanicus Maximus Egypticus Maximus Thebicus Maximus Sarmenticus Maximus five times Persicus Maximus twice, Carpticus Maximus six times, Arminicus Maximus, Medicus Maximus, Adiabendicus Maximus, holder of tribunical authority for the twentieth time, emperor for the nineteenth, consul for the eighth, pater patriae proconsul. Are you sure you know who you're talking to now? Okay, that's his name. So when you addressed him, you had to talk that way. Now, the idea of the very fancy language is not only something which is just for Caesar and for the gods. This was, and still is, a style of addressing people in the Middle East clear up through the 19th century, and in conservative areas we still have it. For example, I have here a translation of a letter written in, in 1891 by a Persian scholar to an American Christian scholar missionary scholar by the name of Dr. Cornelius Van Dyke, who was a professor of medicine and of Orientalism in Beirut at that time. And this Persian scholar wanted to send a nice little gift to uh, Van Dyke to commemorate his visit to him. And so here's what he says. A souvenir to the esteemed spiritual physician and religious philosopher his goodness, the only and most learned who has no second in his age, Dr. Cornelius Van Dyke, the American, as a souvenir presented to his loftiness and goodness and to him that is above titles, who is a propagator of knowledge and a founder of perfections and a possessor of high qualities and owner of praiseworthy character, the pole of the firmament of virtues and the pivot of the circle of sciences, the author of splendid works and firm foundations, who is well versed in the understanding of the inner realities of souls and horizons, who deserves that his name be written with light upon the eyes of the people rather than with gold upon paper. At Beirut in the month of Rabia, the year 1891, by the most humble Abu al-Ma'ali al-Husseini Zenji, just to be sure you know who he's writing to. Well, now, you see, this, says Jesus, you know, God simply doesn't need all of this. When you have your requests, you must talk to him in a direct fashion. Now, let's turn to the first request of the Lord's Prayer and try to see the big bomb that goes off at the very beginning of that prayer. And so here we have it before us, Our Father who is in heaven, let it be hallowed 
your name. I'm putting the words in the order of the Semitic sentence so that we can follow it a little more carefully and see exactly the impact of the language which our Lord used. In Aramaic, this becomes Abbana debismaya yitqaddas shimak. Now, we notice first of all that the Jews, as we said, did know how to pray. They prayed regularly. In fact, they prayed three times a day. And those prayers were, first of all, at sunup, right at sunrise, and second, at three o'clock in the afternoon, and then finally at sundown. Our Muslim friends pray five times a day, and also at set times, and also a very set prayer. And no doubt the Muslim community borrowed their ideas from the Jewish community and patterned their prayers after them because there was a large Arabic-speaking Jewish community in Arabia at the time of the rise of Islam. And so they looked at these people and they borrowed many, many things from them. What did the Jew do when he came to say his prayers? Well, he had two set things that he had to say. One was the, Hear, O God, the Lord, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and strength. And that was the first thing, Shema Israel. And the second thing was that he had a series of what at the time of Jesus was 12 prayers. By the end of the first century, it had been increased to 18. And it is the famous 18 prayers that are still said in the synagogue service amongst Jews today. And it is possible to set these 18 prayers and put them side by side with the Lord's Prayer, and you can find considerable points of relationship and also significant points of difference. The relationship is that daily bread comes at about the same place in the middle. There is some phrases that are introduction. There is a main body at the middle, and there are certain phrases that are a conclusion at the end. Both of them talk about the needs of the present and both talk about the coming kingdom of God. There is a rhyme scheme and a rhythm scheme in both that is somewhat s similar. The doxologies of the two are somewhat similar and both are intended both for individual as well as community use. But there are differences. The Lord's Prayer is much shorter, but not only that, the Lord's Prayer starts off in Aramaic. Now, our Muslim friends say their traditional prayers always in the Arabic language. And the Arabic language of the classical past, they're speaking the language of 7th century Arabia when they say these prayers. And so the Jew, and this is true of a pious Muslim, irrespective of his language or his culture, these prayers must be said in Arabic, the Arabic of 7th century Arabia. And so the Jew also, speaking Aramaic in the first century, would say these classical prayers, one of them taken from the Old Testament, which of course was written in classical Hebrew, and then the set prayers were also in, in uh, Hebrew, and these were recited, the same words every time. Now, okay, the great saint, the great hero of the community, on rare occasions, was free to make up his own prayer, as Jeremias, a great German scholar, has pointed out in his study of this prayer. But the average person, no, that wasn't the way he prayed. He merely recited piously the prayers of the community. And so Jesus starts off by teaching people to pray in Aramaic. Now, how do we know that? We know that because of the first word in the prayer, which is the word Abba, A-B-B-A. -B -A. And this word, precious to Jesus himself, so far as we know, the first time it was ever used to address God was when our Lord himself used it. We know that he used this Aramaic word because of the fact that we find it uh, three times in the New Testament, once on the lips of our Lord himself in the 14th chapter of Mark, and once in the book of Romans, and once in the book of Galatians. Now, in each case, where we find this word, we find that they have put the word in Aramaic, A, B, B, A, and then the Greek translator has put as a kind of a parenthesis, the Father. And so the Greek text itself says, Abba, Ha pater, 
Ha-Pater is the Father, which of course means that the translator was putting in the Aramaic word and then he was translating it for you into Greek. Now, they didn't say both of them. They just said one. The other one is, in case you don't know Aramaic, then you'll be able to read the word. Now, why did they, you know, why did they bother with this particular word? I mean, the other words of their prayers, the words of Jesus, with the rare exception, like Talutha Qumi, little girl, get up, uh, there's about, I think, 50 Aramaic words in the Gospels in which the Aramaic words themselves occur, and usually they're place names or something of this kind. But here is a specific word in prayer occurring in a Greek text in Galatians and in Romans. Something else. That's what I expect from my son David and not from Butrus and Hannah. Now, in the Old Testament, this is used as an adjective, but it is not used as a title. Our Lord, for the first time, uses it as a title, and he uses it in its colloquial form of the word daddy. This is the first word that a young child is taught when he speaks to his father. And to my utter amazement and delight, a few years ago, in the Middle East, teaching this prayer to a group of village women in the mountains of Lebanon, I was explaining the, the fact that, of course, in Arabic, colloquial, we say Ya Baba for dad, but that in Aramaic, the, cla the ancient Aramaic phrase for daddy was Abba, and a smile came across these ladies' faces, and one of them gingerly put up her hand and said, Reverend Bailey, uh, we teach our children to say Abba. And to my delight, I began looking around, and pretty soon I found out that, that Palestinian women and Jordanian women and Lebanese women and Syrian women teach this. Egyptian women and Iraqi women don't. So those who are close to the classical lands of the Bible, this ancient Aramaic phrase is still there, and it is still used. It's not Arabic, and they're speaking Arabic, but this word they've held on to, the first word that kid learns to say is Abba. The long A at the end is the definite article. It really means the father. But the father can mean my father. It also can mean our father. And so, for example, in Luke it says father, and in Matthew it says our father, and both of those are legitimate translations of the phrase Abba. Now, it seems that in the early church, this phrase was so rich and so important to the early Christians that they decided they couldn't get along without it. And so, even though they're Greeks and they're living in Rome or in, in Galatia, they learned this word and they said this Aramaic word as a kind of a symbol for the new relationship which the believer has with God through Christ that they are able through the Spirit to cry out, Abba, as we're told in Romans and in Galatians. And also, interestingly, in the early church, the church had a service which they followed, and they had in those early centuries lots of people who were coming in, interested in the Christian faith, 
but who had not yet believed or been baptized. And so they even built their churches with a kind of the sanctuary was in two sections. And the first section was up front, and that's for the people who were baptized, and the second section was at the back for what they called the catechumens, the people who have come to hear the catechism, that is, the people who've come to hear the sermon and then after the sermon was over, they would be politely invited to leave, and then those who had accepted faith in Christ and been baptized would then celebrate the Holy Communion. The point being, those of you who have not accepted faith in Christ, it is not appropriate for you to participate with us in this sacred meal. And the Lord's Prayer was never said with anybody except the believers. The catechumens were invited to go out of the church before they said the Lord's Prayer. Why? I think, as does Jeremias of Germany, that it's because this word is the first word in the prayer. If you have not come to faith in Christ and through uh, faith in God through Christ, and if uh, it, it is only through that faith that it is possible for you to have the kind of relationship with God in which you are able to cry out and say through the Spirit, Daddy. Now, two revolutions. One is that you're not being asked to pray only at set times of the day, and that's quite a revolution, that any time you feel led by the Spirit to pray, it's possible for you to do so. And second, that you are being taught to pray in your own language, which means there isn't any special language that is the language of God. Now, this is such an incredible revolution, it's difficult for us to get a hold of it and even more difficult for us to keep this revolution going. What I mean by that is that everybody seems to think somehow that God only likes a particular language. All of us have made this mistake. The early centuries of the church, they translated the Bible, and then they got a translation in about the 4th or the 5th or the 6th century, and the language of the people kept changing, and they kept that ancient translation because this was the language of God. You know, I studied, did graduate study with some German Americans, and they had a story they told. They said that God always spoke through a messenger or through an angel, or he spoke through his son finally in the last of the days. But once, once God himself walked on the face of the earth, and that was back in the story of Genesis in which God himself came walking in the garden, and this is the only time God himself walked, and when God himself showed up on the earth, what did he say? He said, Adam, wo bist du? He spoke German, of course. And I have an Armenian student, students tell me that uh, that's not true because God has a very intelligent Armenian monk as a private secretary. And whoever approaches the sacred throne, this monk translates everything keep forgetting this, but Jesus didn't. He started off with Abba, the word a little kid uses to talk to his father. A revolution in language and a revolution in awareness, an awareness that you are set free as you can talk to your dad any time of day or night 
that you want. And a little boy can interrupt his father irrespective of who the father's guests might be. He walks in and he says, Dad, I need you. And Dad listens. And we know that. And so with God, we are able to break into his presence in prayer, in our language and our expressions at any time in which we need him. Perhaps we're used to these things. But imagine the revolution of their great, brilliant beginning back there when this word was first uttered from the lips of our Lord. We said that there are comparisons with the twelve prayers of the synagogue in the time of Jesus, and there are also contrasts. These prayers always begin in the name of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. Well, that's a nice way to address God, no objections. But what if you don't happen to know who I, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are? Then you're going to have a little difficulty praying this prayer because the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob sounds like a very peculiar uh, prayer for a peculiar people with a peculiar history. Granted, through faith we become a part of that history and a part of that same family. But at the same time, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he had a vision of a family of faith that was beyond the community of those who could trace their genealogical heritage back to Abraham. He was looking to the fact that everybody is going to need to know God through faith, and everybody has a father, and thereby, if he teaches them to say, Abba, Dad, then everyone on the same level will be able to address a God of love. But amazingly, right there, in the midst of that same phrase, we've got a very sharp contrast. Daddy, who is in the heavens. And right away, the first of a series of paradoxes that occur in the density of the language of this prayer surfaces. Dad is very near, but this dad is in the heavens, and we're not supposed to forget it. We are creatures. He is the creator. We are the created. He is the one who has made us. We are his servants. He is our master. We are a part of the earth and he is the eternal one. And as we approach him in prayer, there can be, hi, dad, he is my daddy, and at the same time, the other side of that coin, I fall upon my knees before the awesome majesty of a God who is infinitely greater, infinitely beyond me, the God who is near and the God who is far. And all of this is encapsulated in that initial phrase, in the tension and the excitement and the drama and the power of what happens as we learn to speak to God out of our awareness of his compassion and love, our awareness of how near he really is, and our awareness of how far away he is. The mystery of the incarnation, the God who comes to us, and he comes to us in Christ to the point that he is near and there is no place at which God is any nearer to us than when we touch the life of God in our Lord Jesus Christ who comes to us in the flesh, God himself coming to us that we might know him. And when we say, Daddy, when we say, Abba, when we say, Father, we are affirming part of the deepest meaning of the incarnation itself that we are not left alone. We are not standing before an awesome power that is at great distance, but we are in the presence of a God who is both near and far away, who comes to us in Christ, who stands in authority over us, and we initiate the prayer, a prayer for all peoples who know a Father, and thereby all those who have been born, and in that birth are able to understand a God of love who comes near to us as a father and far from us in majesty in the heavens.